All right, so stream will start soon. Yes, we can, but you're speaking Dutch. Y yeah, I'm in Holland. It's uh, difficult, or I'm getting used to speaking Dutch again, which is strange because normally I speak English all day or English mixed with German, but last six days have been completely Dutch. So that's good. All right, so stream will start soon. We already started. So we have a lot to do for today because it's more or less the last lecture. Um, and I will explain to you guys why. Um, we'll still have a lecture next week, but that will not be part of the exam. So this is the last lecture before the exam uh, because I do want to give you guys some time off as well. So today we'll be doing logistic regression. Um, we will be talking about some common R programming idioms, so some common ways of doing things, um, and some other various things which I think you guys should know, especially because I've been working hard on the lecture for uh, uh, next week. Um, and of course, I've been practicing a lot with my drawing board, so I've also made some things that I want to show you guys for next year, for Pandemic Edition 3, if you get one. All right, so let's jump into it. Before we jump into it, the exam dates. I think everyone knows by now, but I still want to repeat it. 21 July and the 9th of the 9th. Um, the best grade will count, so you can do both. Uh, I would definitely advise everyone to do the first, and if you don't pass, do the second. Um, but you're more than welcome to do both of them, so that's perfectly fine. Um, best grade will count. So good luck for that. Uh, we'll have a short overview at the end of the lecture um, to just discuss all of the lectures that we had. And I wanna just highlight what I think is important. So that would be interesting for you guys because then you guys know what the questions will be about more or less. All right, so the assignments. Um, I had one question sent to me via email. Let me open up my email. Um, but if you have any other questions after reading the PDF, um, as was the uh, assignment, uh, then I'm more than welcome to hear any questions. And otherwise, we'll start with the uh, first question that I got. Um, I will just read the question quite quickly. Dear Professor Denny, that's always nice that people call me a professor, although I'm just a doctor. Uh, I'm watching the last lecture and I want to ask you something. Uh, when you were explaining how to correct data for a specific effect, after correcting it, you've done a t-test to compare among the different strains. Uh, my question is, is it the right approach to do a t-test to compare three groups? So it depends a little bit on how we think about linear models. Um, and let me see, I want to switch to the drawing. So I was actually working on the pandemic edition layout but um, so what we have is we want to build a model right so we want to model all kinds of effects and there's a whole bunch of nuisance variables which we're not really interested in um, so we want to get rid of those um, so after we've gotten rid of those i think that's very basic right so that we for example have some kind of a linear effect and so we have our um, uh, let me put it to a color that you guys can see all right, very good. So if we have like a, a, a data distribution and we have some data points scattered around, right? Then in first instance, we wanna look at all of the effects that we have and we wanna kind of draw a straight line um, to get rid of, of some nuisance variables, right? So we have nuisance. Uh, yeah, I'm gonna have to work on my handwriting more, but that'll be okay. So we remove the nuisance variable and then we are left with uh, data distribution. And in our case, we had three different strains, right? So we had uh, the FMI, homozygous, then we had the heterozygous, and then we had the B6 animals, right? And the idea is, is that these things, of course, you can code in different ways, right? So when you do a linear regression, what you could say is, well, we interpret these three groups as being linear, right? Because we are interested in an additive effect where, for example, the B6 allele, going from having no B6 allele to having one B6 allele to having two B6 alleles, um, and, and we code it like that, right? So we say here, this is zero, this is one, and this is two. 
And now when we do a linear regression, what we see is that we have our data points. Let me make those a little bigger though. Um, so we have our data points here in the first group. Then we have our second group, which might be a little bit higher on average. And then we have some other data points in the last group, which again is a little bit higher. So if we code our regression model like this, 0, 1, 2, uh, what happens is, is R will just draw a straight line through it. So what we get is we get just a single beta coefficient. And this beta coefficient tells us having a single B6 allele increases your phenotype by this much. Um, and having two of them is, of course, two times beta. However, when we do a normal linear model, we might want to not code these as numeric because we might be interested in other effects as well, not just the additive linear effect, um, which comes from having a B6 allele, right? Because we can think of situations where we have a different structure, yeah, where, for example, we have the BFMI individuals all being relatively high. Um, we have, for example, the heterozygous all being low. And then we have, for example, the B6 individuals being slightly higher than the BFMI again, right? So if we have the same three groups on the x-axis, but now when we draw a single straight line, this, this single straight line is not going to capture this effect, right? Because we'd have three groups, um, but the, the straight line tries to optimize the distance to each of these groups. So we see that we get a very poor beta coefficient, which is kind of around zero, right? Um, so to circumvent this, we can not code it as one, uh, zero, one, and two, but we can code it as a factorial. So when we do an S factor, um, then what we tell the, the model is to say, well, take one of the groups as being the basis base and then compare the other groups to the base. So what happens is that we have a model, for example, like this, and then we remove the straight line, because if we model it as a factor, what will happen is it will take the first group that it encounters as being the base, so the mean, and then it will do a test to see if this group is different from the group here. And then, of course, we have the other situation where we have this group, which is also being tested against this group. So what we get now when we do, or when we use an S factor, we get two beta coefficients. So we get a beta for group one versus group zero, and we get a beta for group two versus group zero. And now the p-value tells us if any of this is true, right? So if this, if this group one is different from group zero, or if the group two is different from group zero, but it doesn't teach us which group is different. So in that case, we have to do something which is called a post hoc test. So after we did the association and we found that there is a big difference at this marker, we still have to figure out which of the alleles carry the effect, right? Because in, in our situation, having a single or being heterozygous, so having one allele from BFMI and one allele from B6 makes you significantly smaller um, than the first group. But for the second group, that's not really true. The second group is more or less the same as the first group. So, and then we start using the t-test. So for the t-test, we use it as a post hoc test. So once we figured out that there is something going on at this marker, we then want to do a test to see which one of the groups is, is significantly different from the other ones. And so we then do a post hoc test, just saying, well, we do a t-test against group zero and one, we do a t-test for one against two. And of course, we have to do the t-test for one against two as well, right? So in this case, we have to do three tests afterwards um, to figure out um, exactly what is going on on this marker. So that was the thing that I was trying to explain, um, that have first you get rid of the nuisance from your um, variance, so from your phenotype that you're interested in, and then you start doing the t-test if you find as, that there is a difference in one of the groups. Of course, this only works when you model it like a factor, right? Because if you model it like a factor, then you get two of the betas, while if you model it like a, a numeric effect, yeah, so just coding it as zero, one, and two, or minus one, zero, one, um, yeah, then R will treat it as a single linear line, um, and then it will only estimate a single beta. But in the case where we have a pattern like this, then of course we will not get a significant effect, even though one of the groups is significantly different. So linear modeling is very sensitive to the question that you ask in a way. So the way that you model your data, being it as a, a, a linear effect 
a numeric linear effect where you say, well, we're looking at an increase, um, or if you're looking at it as a categorical variable where you're saying, well, I have three different groups or four different groups or five different groups. But if you treat it as a factor, then you always have to do a postdoc test afterwards, comparing the different groups and then making sure that the group which you think is different is really different. Uh, because, of course, hey, depending on the variance, this does not have to be the case. It is not always that the group which has the lowest beta or the highest beta is the group which is the most different um, because that, that holds or that belongs together with the variance. Uh, so a big difference in mean doesn't automatically have to signify that there is a significant difference between the groups. Um, it could be that the variance in one of the groups is really high. All right, so that's it. That's the, the my answer to why do you want to do the t-test? Well, the t-test here, we use it as a post hoc test. So after we did the initial removal of, of, of covariates, uh, the nuisance variables, then we do the association using either a linear effect. If we want to look at additive genetic effects, saying that having a single allele from your mother will increase your phenotype, having two alleles, which are more or less maternal alleles, will double the effect. Um, while we can also look at different types of effect, it doesn't have to be a pure linear effect. You can also just use different groups for this. Um, so wouldn't it be better to do an ANOVA and include them all? Yes, you would first do the ANOVA to do a test to see if there is a difference. And then after you found that the ANOVA says, well, at this position in the genome, there might be a difference. Then you use the t-test to figure out exactly which group is different. Um, of course, this, this also has a little bit of an effect on the p-value, of course, um, because the p-value from the ANOVA will not be exactly the same as the p-value that you get for the um, post-hoc test, right? Because you're doing three post-hoc tests, and from these three post-hoc tests, generally one is significantly different or two, um, but had the, the p-value of this test, of this t-test, will not be the same as the p-value that you have for uh, the linear model. Um, why is the third group not considered? I think I was just lazy and I just compared group zero to one and zero to two, and I forgot the comparison between one and two. Um, sorry for the bunch of questions. No questions are important. So if you have more questions, then uh, let me know. So, all right. So that, that's the question that I got. I also got um, one remark about the exam. If you need to um, have me write you a letter saying that you can join the exam, um, then make sure that I have the request before Monday. On Monday, I'm going to sit down and make letters for everyone. Um, I already made one, so it's just a copy paste. Um, but I know that there are some people who need to have a letter from me certifying that you are allowed to uh, join the exam. Good. So if there's no further questions, I will switch back from my drawing uh, to the assignments. Um, so, in lecture number nine, I would say we did the linear models, so the LM function together with the ANOVA function. Uh, we did mixed models last week, so using LMER to uh, model different groups. So we have a really nice uh, picture of a generalized linear mixed model um, where we see that every group has a different intercept, more or less at point zero, every group has a different um, kind of um, a, a different value where they're hitting that. And we see here that this model also has a random intercept for each of these groups, um, because we can see that the directional coefficient of each group is slightly different. So this is a really nice example of how you can use mixed models to model multiple groups um, and to have like a, a predictor uh, a predictor variable hey, where, we, where we see that when we correct for the groups, um, every group has their own directional coefficient and their own intercept. So today we will be talking more about generalized linear models and generalized linear models is when your um, resulting variable, um, so your, your, the thing that you want to predict, um, is not a normal distribution or is not a continuous variable. So it might, for example, be a case control study where you have cases and where you have controls, and this is the thing that you want to predict. Um, for example, if based on someone's genome or based on some other tests that you did, if an individual is either um, affected or if they are unaffected. Um, so a zero one 
uh, phenotype. So hey, that, that, that's an extension that you can do to general linear models. And then we are talking about generalized linear models because now the output uh, or the thing that we are predicting can be anything that we want. And it doesn't have to be a continuous variable. And so it doesn't have to have a value which can range from zero to 20, but it can be just two possible values or three possible values. All right, so the overview for today, um, we'll start by doing regression. So again, more regression. Have, what if the response is not a continuous variable? What if our response is a zero one? I want to talk to you guys about the long versus the wide format, since that comes up quite a lot and everyone um, has their own opinion on it. Florian, looks better than your office, does it? I don't know. I, I don't have a drawing board, but that's why I have the drawing board here. I, I, I like it. It's nice and green. Um, I hope it doesn't start raining because when it starts raining, it gets really, really noisy. So I hope that that will be okay. Um, so long versus wide format, it's, it's just two different ways of how you write your data down. Um, and both of them are fine and you can go from one to the other, but I just want to explain to you why sometimes it's better to use the one format versus the other format. Like I told you, I want to talk about some idioms today. Um, and one of these idioms is, for example, ex executing external programs, which R is really, uh, which can really help R to become a lot more powerful. If you have the ability to use R to execute things like sequencing programs, um, hey, you can, you can build up a pipeline where R just calls out to different programs and then reads in the results from these programs. And that will help you in the end if you want to build a pipeline which has multiple steps. Or hey, if you have, for example, your data, which are images in a certain folder, um, and you want to go from the images using some external tool like um, ImageJ or some other thing, and then go from having ImageJ um, output files to having comma separated files in which we can do statistics. Um, I will be talking a little bit about how to do scripts from the command line. This ties in, of course, with the executing of the external programs and also how you can supply parameters to our scripts um, using command line arguments um, so that you can write a script and then give the script, for example, a file name as input. So say our script um, resize this photo and then give the name of the photo that you want to resize. And like I told you guys, um, an overview at the end. So the overview at the end will just be going through all of the lectures from one to 10 and highlighting what I think is important. And I hope that with that information, every one of you should be able to do the exam uh, because you kind of know where the questions will be about. Um, like I told you guys, next week will be the last lecture. So next week we will be analyzing some very, very, very fishy data. Um, so I've decided to do the whole thing in the new style, which already cost me like three days of drawing um, to make really, really nice slides for you guys, which are hand drawn and like better than what you've ever seen before, or at least I, I like them a lot. Um, so next week we'll be, be talking about the Bachersee project, um, which is a project where fish have been captured and measured um, across different lakes in Northern Germany. Um, and the data was provided by Professor Adlinghaus. Um, so I, I figured out that with the new drawing board, I can do a lot of things. I have like these pencils, which are like galaxy pencils and stuff, and, and they look really nice. So I'm, I'm, I'm planning on using it a lot more. Um, but I still have to practice my handwriting a lot, a lot, because it takes a lot of time making just one of those slides. Uh, I spent like two days making slides, um, and I had written the code like two hours on the day before, and then making the slides, explaining everything. Um, yeah, so 39 slides cost me two days, which is a massive amount of time. Um, but I hope it's worth it, and I hope that you guys will like it next week. Um, so next week, fishy data, um, and there's a lot of fishy things going on there. So um, let's see what we can find out. Uh, I think that for next week, I will actually make the data available um, so that people can just um, download parts of the data and work with it themselves uh, so that you can have a little bit, have them, then we can play with the data together um, and have some nice drawing and uh, some fun. So I'm really excited about it. I, I like the data set. Um, so I hope that you guys will also be interested in how to analyze some real world data. 
All right, so regression for today. Um, it's good that we don't have any uh, assignments that we have to go through in detail. So I think we can be done quite quickly. I have 55 slides. We're now at slide number seven, so we're making great time. So when we talk about regression and we are talking about the final form of regression, so generalized linear, uh, so generalized linear models, um, and then we're dealing with different response types. So for example, we have a dichotomous outcome variable or a binary outcome variable saying that, well, something happens, we have a certain amount of measurements, and now in the end, we have someone who becomes sick or someone who stays healthy, or we have someone who passes an exam or someone who fails an exam. So when we are dealing with these types of regression, we're doing logistic regression. And that means that our response is not a continuous variable, like in the case of body weight or body length, um, but that we just have a, a dichotomous outcome. So either pass or either fail. So we will be using the data set um, that um, is listed here. Um, and it is a data set which contains admissions to um, UCLA. So um, but they measure all kinds of things. And as students, they apply to go to UCLA and they either get admitted or they don't get admitted. So we have a single response variable, which is called admit, um, which can be one for people who got into the school and zero for people who were not able to get into the school. And of course, for all of these students that applied, they have some predictor variables. Um, so they have their uh, GRE, which is the graduation record exam score. Um, they have the GPA, which is the grade point average. And then they have the rank. And rank here is a little bit of a funny variable because that is the prestige of the high school that the student went through before applying to UCLA. Um, so it's kind of a, a, a five level score where you have like schools who are ranked one, which are really, really good um, high schools. And you have schools which are ranked five, which are like the poorer high schools from where they don't have any lecture materials or online teaching. Uh, but so they, they rated all the schools um, and they have these three predictors which they want to model or which they want to use to kind of figure out what makes a good admission into UCLA and what makes a successful application. All right, so we can load in the data using the read CSV function. Fortunately, we don't have to specify anything because the data is properly formatted. So we don't have to specify that we need a header or where the row names are. No, that's all taken care of. So we can just use the read CSV data or uh, uh, read CSV, and then we just can directly load the data from online and we can store it in the data variable called my data. So now we're all set. So um, first things first, if we want to do logistic regression and we use uh, factors, right? Because the, uh, the GRE and the GPA are of course just numbers. So they are kind of continuous variables, right? You can have a GPA of 4.8 or 4.7. Um, and you can also have a GRE, which is a, a specific number. Um, but rank, the prestige of the school is again, one of these uh, categorical variables, right? So one of these factors. And the thing in logistic regression is that none of the factors is allowed to have a zero in there because we are assigning groups. Um, so the first thing that we have to do is use the uh, X tops to make two way contingency tables. So, and we only have to do this for the rank. Um, so how do we do this? Well, we do the call saying, well, use the X tops function to, to create a two way contingency table. What do I want to have on the X axis of the table? So in the rows, um, Thank you for following. Um, can you guys hear that? I think I muted the desktop audio, but I, I still get a message when someone subscribes. Um, so thank you for subscribing. So we have the admission, um, and then we want to model the admission by the rank of the school. Uh, and we, we definitely need to make sure that none of these is zero, because if any of these is zero, then strange things will happen in logistic regression, um, because then, this rank will always be massively significant. Um, and that just has to do with the fact that when there are no observations, hey, because we're looking at a true false situation. So when there are no observations in one of the groups, um, then the modeling just doesn't work as, as, as it should. Um, so we have to look and see if there's any zeros. Fortunately, there are no zeros. So hey, at, 
zero or the, for the people that weren't admitted, 28 came from a rank one school and 55 came from a rank four school. And from the people who were admitted, you can see that the rank one school has a higher admission rate because almost uh, more than 50% of the people who applied got in. Uh, while when you are from a rank four school, you directly see that that's not the case um, because there for every six people who apply, only one gets accepted into UCLA. Um, so here we can directly see that there is some kind of a structure and that the higher the rank of your school, uh, the bigger or the higher the chance that you get into UCLA. But none of these are zero. So that means that we have a, a, a we can do a model because if, if we would have a zero somewhere, then we should have dropped that rank altogether. Um, and this is very important, especially in logistic regression, um, because you're working with a zero one variable in each of the factor groups, you want to have at least some observations. And I would say if there would be like two observations, right, I would also throw it out. So I want to have at least five or six observations in each of the groups um, to make sure that when we are fitting our model, that our model will be really um, accurate in that sense and that it will be um, correct. So X stops, um, very useful function. You can make two-way contingency table. I think they can even make three-way contingency tables when you just say plus rank plus something else. Um, but um, for two-way contingency table, they're they are really good. All right, so after we checked all the possible contingency tables, in this case, there's only one because there's only one uh, categorical variable, um, then we can do, um, uh, then we can do uh, log it regression. All right, Anna Margareta Redeem, next slide in German. All right, next slide will be in German then. But after we've done uh, the contingency tables, we made sure that there's no group which is zero or very small. Um, then we use, use um, lo logistic regression. Um, so how do we do that? Well, first things first, we have to make the, the, the rank variable a factor, making sure that it's not a numeric variable, right? Because the coding of the rank is zero, one, two, three, four. Um, and we don't want R to be, or to by accident interpret this as a numeric variable. Because we don't know, it might be that there are, that there's a, a different pattern than just a linear pattern in the rank. So we have to make sure that it's a factor. And then we just make our model. So in this case, we use GLM for generalized linear model. So instead of the LM function, which you use by standard regression, we now use the GLM function. And we just build the model as that we always do. So we say, model the admissions by the um, first score, so the GRE score, then we have the GPA score, and then we have the rank, which is a factor variable with five levels. Um, we give it the data. So because we give it the data, we don't have, we can specify the columns of the data frame directly into the model. And we just add saying family is binomial, saying that, well, the output variable is a binomial distribution. So it's either zero or one. Um, and then, of course, we have fitted our model, or it will it will be almost instant because there's not that much data. Um, and then we print the summary of the model. So we print the summary of my logistic regression model. Good. So next slide in Deutsch. Wieder um, mal logistic regression. How would you say that in German? Log hmm. That's a good question. Logistic regression. Logistique regression? Yeah, that doesn't sound very German. Um, but um, for this slide, what we, in this folio, what man sieht, I must auch mich ganz gewöhnen, um wieder Deutsch zu reden. Um, so, was wir observieren, um, natürlich von das Modell, ist am ersten zeigt es uns, welches Modell wir genutzt haben. So, wenn ich mein Summary von mein äh, Variable von meinem Modell mir angucke, dann sehe ich, dass den Formula ähm, wieder aufgelistet ist und ähm, es gibt auch unsere Koeffizienten. So, den Koeffizienten ist natürlich wieder den Koeffizienten, wo wir in interessiert sein. So, es gibt unsere Estimates, so unsere beta coefficients Daneben gibt es auch den Standard-Error von den Koeffizienten. Um, und wir haben auch hier den Probability um, und diese Probability jetzt ist auf ein Z-Distribution, um, hat sich, uh, ist, ist mit ein Z-Distribution berechnet. Um, und das ist dann, das ist dann unterschiedlich, weil hey, wenn man eine normale Regression macht, macht man einen F-Test oder einen T-Test, aber hey, mit einem binomiales Test hat man einen Z-Score, den man ausrechnet. Um, und da 
von den Z-Score kann man dann nach den Probability gehen. Äh, was man sieht, ist, dass den GRE und GPA-Variablen beide einen ganz hohen Influ Einfluss haben auf das ähm, Zugangsgeschehen äh, an den UCLA-Universität. Ähm, aber was man auch sieht, ist, dass hey, wieder hier sehen wir Rang 2, 3 und 4. Äh, und das ist, um dass all diese Bertas wieder ähm, abhängig sind oder äh, den sind relativ von den Rang 1 Gruppe. Ähm, und was man sieht, ist, dass ja, den ersten Rang, Rang 2, ist nicht so signifikant unterschiedlich von Rang 1. Äh, Rang 3 ist unterschiedlicher und dann Rang 4 ist viel unterschiedlicher. Und das haben wir auch gesehen, dass wenn man nach den Tabellen guckt, dass die Tabelle auch ganz deutlich zeigt, dass wie höher den Rang von den School, wie größer die Chance, um zugelassen zu werden. Aber was man hier ganz genau sieht, ist, dass es hier in logistischer Regression nicht so etwas gibt wie einen einzelnen p-Wert. Ja, normal, wenn wir das mit einer kontinuierten Variable gemacht haben, dann hat man nur eine Beta Estimate bekommen oder man hat verschiedene Werte, aber jedes war in den Summary zusammengefasst in eine p-Wert. So, die Frage jetzt ist natürlich, wie unterschiedlich oder wie signifikant ist der Einfluss von Rang auf die Zulassung auf die Universität? Ähm, ja, weil es ist anders als mit einer normalen LM-Funktion, wo man nur eine p-Wert äh, bekommt für jede äh, 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 Predictor-Variable. Äh, aber hier, äh, weil es logistische Regression ist, bekommt man einen unterschiedlichen p-Wert. So, äh, ein bisschen wie ein post hoc test äh, bekommt man den p-Werten relativ äh, zu den ersten Gruppen. Aber hey, wenn wir wissen wollen, wie signifikant den äh, Rang zusammengefasst ist, dann können wir das auch ausfinden. Und dafür, uh, we can use the AO, AOD package. Um, because if you want to summarize different coefficients into a single, um, um, into a single kind of p-value, so a single likelihood, um, you can just add up the p-values, right? It's not that you add up three p-values and divide by three and then say, well, this is the likelihood of, of the, or the average right likelihood of rank. Um, so there's a formal way of doing this, and doing this um, requires doing a vault test. Um, the vault test is not standardly available in R, so we have to install first the AOD package. So we can install the package using install.packages, and then we can say library AOD. And, and by loading the library, we get now access to all of the functions which are provided in there. And now we can use the vault.test function uh, to compute the significance of the rank variable. Um, but we first need to know which of the coefficients we need to combine, right? Because when we do coefficient of my logit model, what we see is that we see the coefficient of the intercept, the coefficient for the GRE, the GPA, and then we see the three coefficients for the rank, which are relative to rank number one. Um, so here we can just count. This is the first coefficient, the second, the third. So we want to summarize coefficient number four, five, and six together into a single variable. Um, and that, that's the thing that we have to remember. It's coefficient four, five, and six that we want to summarize. So how do we combine this? Well, we can do the wall test where we say that the beta that we want to test is the different coefficients of my logit model, right? So I give it all of the coefficients for the model um, in the beta. I give it the variance covariance structure of the model in sigma. Um, and this is because to estimate or to kind of group different coefficients together, it needs to know the standard error. So it needs to know if um, the the different betas are linearly related to each other. So you can do that by providing the VCOF structure. Um, this is just the variance covariance structure. So it gives it, it gives the, the vault test function um, the ability to say or to see, well, this coefficient has a very, a very small standard error, while some of the other coefficients might have lar larger standard error. Um, and then we specify which terms we want to kind of summarize. So in this case, we want to summarize terms four, five, and six. Um, and we want to just get a single value for how significant is this or are these three groups from the rank one school. So hey, we're, we're grouping them all together. 
Um, so when we do that, we see that we get a chi-square score. Um, we take three degrees of freedom yeah, because we're grouping three um, very, or we're grouping three different levels together. Um, and we see that the probability of this having a significant effect on the admission or the combined effect of these three groups relative to the first group is 0 0.0001. All right, so that's how we do logistic regression. The model itself is again, very, very similar. Hey, you just use the GLM function instead of the LM function and you have to specify the family. So in our case, binomial, because we have a zero one possibility for an outcome. So we can then combine the terms if we have a factor variable, and then we get a single p-value for the combined factor. Um, and of course, in logistic regression, um, often when you are dealing with biological data or data which is done in a hospital on sick people and healthy people, uh, we are doing a kind of case control study. And in a case control study, we always report results not as uh, beta coefficients, but as odds ratios. Right, so the odds, odds ratio is more or less the, the increase in chance of becoming sick in one group relative to the other group. Right, so it's not that you have a, a beta of plus 1.5 sickness units, um, but in, in when we talk about case control studies, we generally express the difference from one group to the other group as being the difference um, uh, in an odds, odd, in a ratio. Right? So we want to say that, well, if you are smoking, then you have 50% uh, more chance of this disease. While if you are eating tomatoes, uh, this decreases your chance by 8 or 20%. Or um, so how do we calculate the odd ratio? Well, the odd ratio is very easy to calculate. We can just take the natural uh, logarithm, so the inverse of it, so the exponent. Um, so how do we do that? Well, we say exponent. And then we take the coefficients of the model that we just calculated, and these will give us the odds ratios. Um, if we want to also add the 95% confidence interval, so hey, what are the boundaries um, in which the odd ratio is, is more or less, uh, which, what is the 5% um, um, uncertainty or, no, what is the, not, what, if we take the confidence interval, what we will know is that 95% of the cases, the real value, the real increase will be between these two bounds. And if this is significantly different from zero, then there is generally a significant influence of your factor. Um, so if we do that, then we see that the odd ratio of the GRE is relatively low. Um, so the, it, it, it has no big effect. Um, it only has a 0.2% increase in your um, chances to, um, to uh, become admitted. But you see that the GPA has a massive effect that has 123% additional chance. So if you have a high GPA, um, this counts much more than having a higher GRE. And then we see the different ranks. Uh, so we see that the rank of the schools are below one, uh, which means that rank number two has 50% chance of getting admitted compared to people from a rank one school. Um, people from a rank three school have around a 26% chance of getting admitted and people in a rank four school have around a 21% chance of getting admitted, um, which is more or less similar to what we saw. And of course, here we see the confidence interval. So the real value will, so will probably be somewhere between like a 9% chance all the way up to a 47% chance compared to a rank one individual. Right, so that's the case control. Um, and so um, in case controls, we generally prefer to mention things as odd ratios instead of just beta, uh, beta estimates. So we can take the exponent of the coefficient and then we get the um, odd ratio. I see my moderator is not helping me delete messages, so I will delete it. All right, next slide. We now, I, I just showed you how to do this with a, um, with a, a variable which is zero or one. Of course, there can be many, many different distributions, right? We can have a Gaussian distribution and also using a Gaussian or using a normal distribution with a continuous variable, we can of course use the GLM function. And the LM function does nothing but just call the GLM function saying that this is always a Gaussian distribution. But you can use the GLM not just with Gaussian, you can use it with binomial distributions, so zero, one. Um, gamma distributions, which are distributions which are similar to a normal distribution, but slightly 
different, so slightly uh, compressed or slightly extended. Um, we have inverse Gaussian distributions, which is, of course, not a normal distribution, but the other way around. So hey, where the, most of the values are to the sides, and there's kind of this U-shape in the middle of the distribution. Uh, we have the Poisson distribution, which is counted. So um, when I think of a Poisson distribution, I always think of the number of bees on a flower. Um, hey, if you see a flower, generally there's no bee or there's one bee. Sometimes there's two, sometimes there's three, but there's not going to be like 50 bees on a flower. So the Poisson distribution starts off with having like high observations of the zero and the one, and then you have very low observations of two, three, four, and five. So it, it, it's kind of an normal where you look at one side of the normal. But Poisson is always counted data and not continuous, so it cannot be 2.5. Um, and of course, we have different other distributions like quasi, quasi-binomial, quasi-Poisson, which are all distributions which are very similar um, to the Poisson distribution or to the Gaussian distribution or to the binomial, uh, but not exactly a standard binomial distribution. So you can just specify these. And so in the family argument, uh, when we go back here in the family binomial, we can then say family is Gaussian or family is Poisson. And then it will deal with the response variable and it will also check if the response variable is really binomial or Poisson. All right, so that's everything I think for regression so far. So we talked about generalized linear models uh, or general linear models. You can use the LM function. We talked about mixed models and repeated measurement models uh, where we can use the LME4 package and use the LME function or LMER function to do the model. And we have generalized linear models where we have things or different responses to our, um, to our predictors. So which might be binomial, which might be Poisson um, or Gaussian. Um, and of course, these are all generalized linear models. So you can decide which model you want to use. And of course, you have to first look at your data on how it, how it looks like. Um, but then you can che check the model that you have. If you have any grouping in your data or repeated measurements, then you're forced to use mixed models. But there is also a GLMM, um, which is a, a mixture. So it's a generalized linear mixed model. Um, so it's the same as a general a generalized linear model, but it also allows you to do repeated measurements in there. All right. Good. So I've been talking for 42 minutes. Um, how many slides is this? This is a couple of slides. Let's just do a couple because it's now 242. So we can do like 10 minutes more of uh, long versus wide format. Good. So when we're... When we're thinking about data and data in data frames or data in matrices, um, then we can have different ways of writing data down. And it is always difficult to go from one format to the other format, or it's not difficult, but it, it's always a little bit tricky because some uh, algorithms, they require you to have data in a wide format, while other algorithms require you to have data in a long format. So the data format that you generally have for a linear model is the wide format, right? Because we have um, an observation. So we have, for example, mouse number one, which has been measured on a certain date. And then we have the first measurement, like the body weight, or hey, in the case of the students, we have the admission, uh, the GRE, the GPA, and all of these measurements on a single individual are mentioned in a single row of the matrix. So we call this wide format when we've measured different variables um, which are described by one or two columns. So this is called wide because there's multiple measurements um, in the same row of the table. The long format is slightly different because the long format has this additional column called variable. And this is what has been measured. So it always has only a single value instead of having three values. What we now see is we, we don't have a single row with three values, but we now have three rows, and all of these three rows have only one value. And then there's a, a, a column called variable, which describes what variable was measured. So this is called the long format, and this is called the wide format. So if you want to go from one to the other, there's this reshape two package, and this reshape two package allows you to go from wide format to long format back to wide format if you if you need to, um, without having to 
manually copy paste your data or make new data frames yourself. Um, so it's a really handy package for if you have your data in one format and the algorithm that you're trying to use requires it to have in a different uh, in a, in a different type. So question to you guys first, if we look at the air quality data set, is this a long or is this a wide data format? And I'll just wait a little bit because I think that there's some delay, um, but just throw in chat if you think it is long or if you think it is wide. So, and I'm just gonna sit here a little bit I might actually do my high voice, but uh, we're just going to wait on this slide until someone answers. So, Toka Farol says it's wide. All right. Aku, Akaubi, Akaubi, wide. Wide. Okay. So, there's a lot of people going for the wide format. So, the, the, does, uh, for example, Toka Farol, do you want to explain why it is wide? Because it is wide, of course. That's 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 very logical, uh, and I, I think that anyone can see that. So wide, good. Then we'll just keep it there. So the reason why it is wide is, of course, because you have on a single measurement, so on a on a month and on a day, you have four different measurements next to each other. Right, so this is a dead giveaway that it's a wide format. Um, so of course we can go and take the air quality data set and go from having a wide format air quality data set to having a long format, uh, long format air quality data set. Yeah, it's not concentrated. The thing which uh, um, what, what you can where you, what, the easiest thing is to look and see if there's a variable. Right, so if there's a variable thing and if there's a single measurement, um, then it's definitely long format. Um, but in this case, wide format, why? Because we have like four different measurements and then we have two columns describing the measurement, right? So it's, uh, it's kind of a two columns saying when the measurement was done and then four different measurements. So it's definitely a wide format. All right, so how do you recognize these things, right? So you always have identifier columns, um, because data has been measured, so there's always columns needed to uniquely identify a row. So, for example, the sample na name, the date, the month, or the year at which it was measured. And so when we look at the air quality data set, we have two ID, so identity columns, right? We need the day and we need the month column to uniquely identify a single measure. So that is what we need to first do ourselves, is to identify that these are the two columns that we need to uniquely identify a measure. And then we have measured variables, right? So those are the columns that contain the measured values. So those are ozone, solar radiation, wind, and temperature. Those are the things that we measured. And these are the four columns that we need to now kind of squish into the variable column. And then, of course, all of the values go into the, the value column. Um, so melting is going from wide to long so if we go from the air quality data set as it is now we can melt it into the long format and the other way around is called casting so going from the long format to the wide format is called casting and also the function names are based on the terminology so if we want to take our air quality data set and we want to melt it from the wide format into the long format, how do we do that? Well, we have to say melt for the function melt, give it the air quality data set. Then we have to say that the ID variables, so the ID vars are the month and the day, right? Because it needs to know that these two columns are not measurements, but identification. And then we have to specify which variables were measured. So in our case, we have four measured variables, ozone, solar radiation, the wind, and the temperature. So when we do this call, then we get, I store it here in a new variable called molten. And then when I look to see how molten looks like, um, then this is how it looks like. So what we see is that we have the month, the day, then we have variable saying which column did this measurement originally come from. And then we have value, and that is the measured value on this month and on this day. So going to a long format. So there's one thing which is a little bit annoying here um, because we have these things. 
right? Because on the fifth month, on the fifth day, the ozone concentration had a missing value. And we can already see that that was the case here in the, uh, in the white format, right? Um, but in the long format, these two rows are completely unnecessary, right? Because they don't add any information, um, right? There, there wasn't a measurement. So why have this row all together? Um, so the nice thing is, is we can automatically get rid of that um, because what we can say is say na.remove equals true. So and then it will just show or it will just leave out the NA values. So once it, it sees that one of the measured bars has an NA in there, then it will not add a additional line. Um, so when we then sample some random numbers, um, when we show 10 random rows, uh, we now see that there is no NA value occurring anymore. Yeah, so NA.RM equals T. Um, it's actually better nowadays to spell true, so T-R-U-E, um, and that is just because R doesn't like you specifying true and false by T and F anymore. But um, So yeah, the NA remove will just remove all of the kind of non-informative rows when you are melting from the long, uh, from the wide format into the long format. Of course, we can also go back. Um, this is called casting. Um, so there's this function decast. Um, and what we can say is we can now say, so decast our just molten uh, data set, right? Because we went from wide to long. So now we give it the long format. And now we specify in a kind of formula way um, how our data is structured. So we are going to say that, well, we have our month plus day. And then what was measured on the month plus day, well, the variable column was measured on every month and every day. And what we see then is when we do, if we, if we store the results from that, when we look at the head, we get more or less the original data set back. Um, the only thing which has changed is of course, is that it randomly chose the order. Um, and of course the day and the month, the month and the day are the first two columns because the ID columns get mentioned first, and then it will go through the list um, and say, okay, so I see a wind. So that's gonna be the first column and it puts in the number. Uh, but this is a very easy package, which allows you to go from wide format uh, to long format and back um, with a single call. Um, so when you ever need it because of an algorithm, because the algorithm just happens to need long format, uh, you can easily go from one format to the other format. And uh, the package is relatively optimized. So even if you have like millions of measurements, it still will not take too long. Um, and doing that by hand using for loops um, might be a big issue because that might take a long time to do. All right, then we will take a short break here. I will be back at 3.05. Um, and for you guys, there will be animated GIFs, of course. I just forgot what. It's either goats or birds or a combination of the two. Um, well, doesn't matter. I will see you guys in around 10 minutes and get some coffee and uh, take a breath. And then we will continue with some more common idioms. Um, so I will see you guys soon.